very much, Moshe. And just before I start, make a few comments, I also want to join um, in thanking all the facilitators of this. I think, is this the third or second or third year in succession I've been here? Last year I spoke about the humanities or the crisis of the humanities. And uh, I'll say something about the humanities today within the international context. But obviously, um, when a person opens a session, they always thank everybody except for themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to, in addition to everybody that Sharon Pardo thanked at the beginning, is of course to thank Sharon himself for being such an excellent director of the European Centre at Ben Gurion University. <laughs> and, for, and together with Moshe bringing in the Bologna process. And, um, and as he said, we've become, in the middle of the Negev, a real hub for European activities. Uh, the truth is, he very kindly said that I founded the centre I was 50% responsible, the other 50% was Professor Joel Peters, and as you know, um, in, uh, uh, in two days' time on, on Ben Gurion University campus, we have a big session on innovation in science. Um, often that uh, inspiration of innovation is what counts, and the truth is this Center for European Studies was founded on an early morning metro or tube ride in London when Joel and I had to meet, and we were sitting on the tube thinking, what are we going to do next at Ben Gurion University? And that's where the European Centre came into being 11 years ago, thanks, of course, also to the sponsorship of the Ben Gurion Foundation um, in the United Kingdom and, and Harold Paisner. Um, I'm going to make four major points about internationalisation. I'm going to, re I really like Chagit's presentation because it really laid the foundations, and I want to take on from there and look more at the present and think about what are the problems facing us as we become, as we try to become even more international, but within the context also of the fact that we're a country with a specific culture and history, which is something we want to focus on at certain times, particularly in the humanities. I didn't quite accept your distinction that the soft sciences should be local and the hard sciences international. On the contrary, I think we should be producing today new boobers and new magnuses, and we should be also producing the philosophers and the historians and the literary experts who are as international as the people in chemistry or medicine, um, because that is something which actually Israel and the Jewish tradition has always given to the world and should be continuing to give to the world, and we should not become over-parochial in the way that we look at the humanities and social sciences, and we need to give that as big an international push as we do the very important developments in cyber science, in nanoscience, and in medicine, and so on. I think one very important point to make is that, of course, that Israel's role in this internationalization game is a very asymmetrical one. We need to be part of the international scene much more than the international scene needs us. Now, they do need us because we happen to have top-rate researchers. Uh, Chagit showed the number of Nobel Prize winners, and I know also from my, uh, my uh, uh, contacts with the European Union, also with my discussions around issues of boycott, which I will relate to in a minute, that one of the things that is always said to us, by, or said to me by many university principals, uh, particularly in Europe, particularly in the UK, is that the majority of them are not interested in the political debate about boycott. I'll come back to that in a minute. What they're looking for in today's competitive scientific world, they're looking for the best people to do research with, the people who are going to help them land the FP7 and the Horizon 2020 and the BSF. And when they're looking around the world at where and who are the best researchers, Israel is pretty much in the top five of their list. And that's how you become international. Um, and that, but at the same time, they have other places to look at as well. So there's competition for being part of those consortia which, uh, which make applications for large research grants internationally. And of course, we need to be part of the international scene much more than they need us. And that is why it is always very important to be one step ahead in terms of innovation um, and in terms of, as I say, moving away from a parochialist perspective on how important Israeli science and thinking is to Israel as well, which of course any scientific uh, endeavor is to its own country. Um, and that's where I raise an issue which may be more relevant to the humanities and the social sciences than others, and that is we have to be far less parochial in our perspective on language. Um, it's very important for Israel to have its Hebrew language and to develop its Hebrew language, but I know as a dean I encounter too many cases of people 
who are not prepared to make that one step further and say if we really, really want to be international, we want to have the international courses, not just overseas student programs, but joint degree, that's something of the past, uh, but joint degree courses, bringing good research students and bringing good faculty to this country, we have to be prepared, even if we were brought up in this country, to be able to speak, maybe not the Queen's English, but certainly we have to be prepared to make a much bigger push in being prepared to open all of our teaching, even at the undergraduate level, um, to English, not in place, obviously, of the local, uh, of, of Hebrew and Ivrit, but as a complementary at the same level, because what we want to do is we want to get our students in on the ground floor from day one when they're studying for undergraduate degrees to become well-versed, to become uh, uh, used, that it shouldn't be some special or extra effort for them, because if we want them to become the country's future researchers and the future faculty, and we want them to be the people who develop the international links with the international universities in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we need them to feel comfortable with that. And as I say, and therefore I start by making a plea um, against um, parochialism and finding a new balance and the correct balance in how we emphasize the local, we don't lose the local, but at the same time we, we use it as a, as, a, as a hinge for developing much stronger international links. Um, there's a level here which relates to government, um, uh, not so much the Ministry of Education but others, and that is we want to bring in good research students, we want to bring in faculty. Um, I go to many university uh, campuses around the world and I'm amazed that when they talk about internationalization today, it's not because they have in a department of 20 professors, say two people from outside the country, it's because those departments may have 50% or even more of their faculty from different countries and they may have 60 or 70% of their doctoral students coming from other countries, which not only is internationalization and research, there are also all sorts of political gains to be had from that as people become more familiar with you, your society, your habits, which is something, of course, Israel, particularly today, uh, could do a lot more with in bringing in a far greater number of foreign faculty and foreign, re and foreign research students, PhDs and so on, to be part of our system here. And here I think, um, I don't know if I'm only talking from my own experience, but Chagit's here, my university rector is here. I didn't know he was going to be here when I saw him three hours ago on Ben Gurion University campus, so I have to taper in some of my comments. Um, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, um, but nevertheless, we um, all are aware that we encounter a lot of problems concerning visas and the ability to bring in students and certainly the ability to bring in foreign faculty. We don't want to turn our universities into universities where, uh, because Israel is Israel at the end of the day, so we don't want to turn our universities into a place where 50 and 60% of the faculty are non-Israeli. But I know every time that we bring in, when we have a search for a new position, and we may get today for nearly every new position 30, 40, 50 files landing on the table. There are always some files of excellent people there who would not automatically qualify for citizenship in this country and we make their lives very, very difficult. And so either every year they have to reapply for a visa and after two or three years they say, hey guys, you know, I'm going somewhere else. And that's a shame because we can't say internationalization on the one hand and not take all the necessary measures to make it easier to be part of the international scene. It is a, it is a, it, it is a, a cyclical process we want our faculty and students to go out and do postdocs abroad. We then want to them to come back with their international experience and be faculty and students here. But we want our faculty to go to other universities. We are a, an education, academic producing country. We are always producing more qualified research students and PhD students than our universities will ever have enough places to fill. And that is why we should be actually pleased that it's not the best ones, not the brain drain, but we should be pleased that so many of them do find major positions in foreign universities and do win Nobel Prizes, but we also have to be prepared to take in. It's a, it's a, it has to be made much more of a symmetrical situation uh, from, from that point of view. Um, I want to, um, we also, of course, as Chagid said, we're very much part of the European uh, research arena. Um, I dread to think what would have happened to the internationalization of our universities had we listened to some voices a year or two ago and because of various political pressures not signed onto Horizon 2020. 
um, what was the FPs and now the Horizon 2020, I think is one of the two or three most important planks in Israeli international research. And, uh, to, and to the best of my knowledge, Israel is one of those countries who actually receives more success in its proposals to these bodies than actually the amount it has to contribute as a country to the European research arena. And I think we should be very proud of that. It's a very tough process. I've sat on that process both as a submitter of proposals and in the years I haven't submitted, I've also sat on as an evaluator in Brussels of proposals. Israelis are very involved in it. They make very good proposals. They're very highly valued. And I think we should uh, be aware that despite the um, overall political discourse, the very ambivalent uh, discourse uh, between Israel and Europe, which probably will never leave us, um, nevertheless, we are very much part of the European research arena, and we have to remain that, in addition, of course, to the other important research arenas of North America and uh, the growing research and teaching arena of China, um, Canada, of China, Korea, and Japan. And as someone who has recently visited both Korea and China, and I'm sure some, many other people here have done as well, it is absolutely unbelievable to see the amount of government resources which are going into the development of the higher education sector and the university sector in those countries. Um, and since the political relationships are less tense between Israel and the East and the Far East, that's obviously something we have to uh, develop over the years. Um, beyond the academic side, I also want to make two additional comments, which I suppose you could say are sort of political or pseudo-political comments about, um, about Israel's internationalization in the area of research and the teaching. One concerns boycotts, and the other concerns uh, what I, and some of you have heard me say this in the past, I'll maybe be a bit less contentious today, about what I uh, see as the growing politicization um, of the academic arena within Israel in recent years. Concerning boycotts, I've been very involved, certainly in Europe, and in the case of the UK, um, and I would say Chagit is partially right and partially wrong in what she says about the impact of last summer's events on potential boycotts of Israel by the academic community. In the bigger picture, she's absolutely correct. Um, in the bigger picture, it, with the exception maybe of less people visiting us for conferences, um, and I make that point because in two weeks' time I'm hosting an international conference with between 50 to 60 international participants. That sounds very nice except for the fact that every four or five years I have a big conference on geopolitics and borders, and in the past I've always had 80 to 100 participants. Um, so that in itself says something, and the sort of responses I get in, okay, there have been two or three people who have been very upfront and said to me, you know what, David, um, it's not you, you know, some of my best friends are, um, it, it's not you, but you know, we don't agree with Israel's policies, we don't agree with what Israel did in Gaza, therefore we are not coming to Israel. So on the one hand I get angry with them, on the other hand I say at least they're up front and they're honest about it. Um, there are quite a number who, you know, at the last minute will write to you and say, well, our government has said because of recent events in Jerusalem or in Gaza, um, etc., it's not safe for us to travel to Israel anymore. Um, and some of them may be very naive, maybe actually, if it's their first visit to Israel, think that way. Some of them, of course, use it as a curtain to not want to come and say, well, really, I don't want to come to Israel, I want to boycott you. Um, again, I agree with Chagid, it's marginal rather than major, and if it does touch upon us in the international uh, system, it is very much the question of coming to Israel for uh, conferences, but in all other aspects of international connections, I say that as a dean who has to ask for reference letters for promotions, who has to promote international research projects. Uh, until this year, I was the editor of an international journal of geopolitics, and I can't say that, again, with very minor exceptions, I can't say that being an Israeli in that sense has impacted negatively um, too much on the way people relate to it. And yet, on the other hand, there is, there is a silent boycott going on. Um, there is a silent boycott going on, and there is, I think, a growing but small growing number of people who have decided for their own reasons whatsoever, we don't want to, at least not publicly, 
do research with Israeli academics or scientists, um, in many cases, not necessarily because they have an anti-Israel position, because they feel it's politically incorrect today in terms of who they're mixing with and who their candidates are. And the example I always give of a sort of very minor silent boycott is the idea that if you're advertising for a postdoctoral position or uh, two postdoctoral positions at a foreign university, and you get to a short list of about 10 really excellent candidates. So it's impossible to differentiate between. Every one of them is as good as each other. And at the end of the day, you have to choose two. It's not an easy selection process. Any one of my colleagues here knows exactly what I'm talking about. And there can always be someone sitting around the table who yesterday saw a piece of news, or yesterday sort of heard that there was a, a certain type of lecture going on at campus. And they're saying to themselves, even without thinking about it, you know, we've got 10 great candidates here. Two of them are Israelis. They're excellent candidates. But what do I need, as they say, a dre in the cop? What do I need, you know, to, uh, to choose this guy if tomorrow someone's going to come knocking on my door and saying, why did you bring in an Israeli uh, to, to this university? I think it happens very rarely, but I think it's happening even in the subconscious. And I think that's something you can't really quantify, but I think here and there it's happening, and we have to be aware that it's happening. So although on the one hand I agree it touches very, very marginally, there are enough universities and there are enough scientists and there are enough academics out there in the world, all of whom who want to do work with Israeli academics, for it not to have a major impact. Nevertheless, there is a marginal impact there, and we have to be very aware of that. And the politicians have to be aware of that when they're making statements and when they're taking on political positions, that these things obviously affect Israel's overall standing and overall image in the world. If I'm allowed to use a British understatement, even after being 30 years in Israel, Israel's image in the world today is not the greatest it's ever been. Um, and I would say that not all of our leading politicians today, uh, present company excluded, um, are always totally, are always really aware of what the wider implications of this may be. And it certainly could impact more so in the academic world, but uh, I agree with you, it's, it's not a major issue at the moment. The final point I want to make, maybe even more contentious, that is I think um, we have to be very careful. I was very pleased that Chagit made this very important point and says that uh, Council of Higher Education, the VATAT, they are a buffer between government and between the universities. I think some of us may feel that uh, uh, the control of academic institutions in Israel today has become a bit over-centralized. Um, and there's a sort of a move towards over-unification of, um, of parameters when, of course, uh, the necessary criteria for humanities are very, very different to those which are required for the hard sciences or for medicine. But I think the buffer role of the CHA is not just important for us here, it's important for the way that the uh, academic and scientific community in Israel is seen by the outside. In the past few years, there has been, in my view, certainly under the previous education minister, an, an heightened and over-politicization of some of these buffer bodies. I think uh, whether we agree or don't agree with what, what has been going on, it left an extremely poor image of Israel's scientific community in the wider international world. And if the world looks on and says, well, Israel or any other countries, uh, scientific institutions, are becoming too tainted with politics and too tainted with political ideology, they're going to step back and they're going to walk away. And we have to make absolutely sure that if we want to really promote internationalization, because that today is the name of the game, you can't be just a localized scientific community anymore. We are part of a global network. We are crossing international borders. And if you really want to be part of that, then we have to really ensure that the regulatory bodies and the legislative bodies really do retain their total independence and their buffering uh, and their role as a buffer. Um, and I think that's really an important thing that we have to think about because that also displays an image to the outside community. Overall, of course, I don't need to tell people here, Israel has an extremely strong and active uh, scientific community. It's seven research universities, uh, the Open University, the regional college, and, and, and so on. Um, you know, they have international status. We have international status. We have to ensure that we maintain that international status, that we keep the best researchers and the best faculty 
here in Israel so that the Nobel Prize winners who are Israeli are at the Weizmann Institute and at Ben Gurion University, of course, and not necessarily Israelis who are now in Harvard or at UCLA or whatever. That's a real challenge um, for our universities, and we have to ensure that we promote at every possible opportunity joint teaching, joint research, and thus enhance the internationalization of our scientific community. Thank you.